seminar number eight, which doesn't have a title because it's some sort of review of things that we have done and where we have been and some of the things that uh, we could talk about from this. But the first thing I make an observation of is the accidents that we've actually looked at um, because these are all events now that you could use in your descriptions. Um, and um, roughly in order, um, it's Three Mile Island, which is in March of 1979. Um, and then in May of 1987, there's the Stark and then Vincennes. This is 1988. And um, then in March of 1989, there's the Dryden Air Ontario crash. And then in September of 99, there's uh, uh, Tokaimura, the reprocessing accident. And then in March, again March, 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 is uh, the Texas BP city uh, explosion. And then um, in uh, September of 08, there's the Chatsworth train collision. What you can conclude from this is that you should be very cautious in March because it turns out that almost everything, there's a statistical, there's a statistical improbability here, which is that two months get a lot of stuff. There are, there are three in March, there are two in September, and there's only one in May. So you would conclude from this that March is a particularly bad month. I'm not sure why that is. But the fact is that we could take all of these accidents and we could say these are just examples of accidents from other kinds of, of areas. And, and basically where we find these accidents is in the energy world, that is getting energy out of the earth and doing things with energy. Um, and in mining and construction and manufacturing, particularly chemical manufacturing, and also in transportation in various forms. And the reason we get these events out of these, and there are many, many others, you can find tremendous numbers of these events around. The reason we get these events and see them is because they're too public to be hidden. When the events occur, you can't hide them. The accidents are too large and too powerful and too meaningful, too expensive. They're too big and damaging for people to pretend that they didn't have them. It's not that they're so terribly destructive. Some of them are and some of them aren't. But we have car accidents all the time that are tragic. We have medical accidents all the time that are tragic. But we don't get we don't get these kinds of huge public responses to them because they're not so widely um, uh, visible. And and this should tell you that the reason that we are talking about these is because they do get they do get um, they are studied, okay, and they're reported on. And they're also, what we would say in English, is contentious. That is, there's lots of disagreements about them. They're important disagreements. And so people, the press has one view, and the, the lawyers have another view, and the unions have another view. And the fact that there are so many different perspectives with so much disagreement about what happened and why did it happen, there's so much disagreement that that makes for a story that becomes very widely told. 
that's a kind of an artifact of the size of these accidents and so on, but it gives us this collection which we can talk about that doesn't mean that, other, that the same kinds of problems aren't happening elsewhere. It's just that we can see it here. And from this, we've, we've collected uh, essentially a, col uh, a kind of group of ideas or things that we've looked at. And I made a short list of the ones. Um, we got Rasmussen's Gould means hierarchy. This idea that there's that everything that we do is a means to some higher level goal and every goal is accomplished by lower level means, but that something is both a means or a goal depending upon whether or not you're looking up or down in the hierarchy. Um, we got skills, rules, and knowledge. Again, a Rasmussen idea that there are these different levels of processing that people can do, some of which are very uh, intensely uh, cognitive and others which require little resource and therefore can be done very easily. We got cognitive systems engineering, which we got from Woods and Holnagel, and which gives us some means of of talking about what it is that we're trying to do. We're trying to make a world in which it's easier for people to do these sorts of things, uh, to accomplish these kinds of, of uh, goals. Um, we, we in, as part of this, we got Woods talking about mapping cognitive demands. Remember his paper on mapping cognitive demands? It's in complex problem solving worlds. But the point here is that, that how one of the ways to get into this cognitive systems engineering is to figure out what is, what is required of people. What are the demands for cognition in these complex problem solving worlds? We had a couple of concerns expressed by Hutchins in um, the Micronesian navigation story. This is mostly in the form of cautions for us because what he shows in there is that our pre-assumptions about how people must do these cognitive tasks are very often grounded in our own understanding of the tasks and we can't really see how they do it. That, or see is the wrong word. We cannot understand how they construct the problem that they are solving and so we very often mistake this. And he points out the example is the Micronesian navigators who've spent who people have studied for a very long time but could never really get to because they couldn't have a non-map based solution for navigation. None of, the exp none of the people who were studying it could ever break themselves away from the idea that you needed to have a map and the assumption was that the Micronesians must have a map somewhere and they kept looking for the map. And they don't have a map. They don't use map based stuff. And that's an important caution because remember that what we're doing here is, is very often a lot of inference about what we see, not directly observing. We cannot directly observe complex problem solving situations and the cognition in them. We can only make inferences about what it is that people are in fact doing in their cognition. We cannot look at the cognition directly. So everything that we see is some sort of inference, an indirect kind of process. It's always indirect. Everybody admits that. But Hutchin cautions us because he, he has an example of where this has really gone wrong in an important way for a long period of time. And he wants us to pay attention to this because the key thing, the key breakthrough that makes it possible for him to understand this is to essentially 
understand what it's like to be a Micronesian navigator. And if you read what he's talking about in his book, in, in the chapter, he says, he talks about imagining himself on the boat traveling with these people and what it's like, that nothing changes for long periods of time, and that you seem to be still in the water because you don't really have a sense of you moving. There's nothing to judge that by. And so the world moves past you and you are stationary. This understanding, which is so critical to getting how they do this, is something that's very hard to get be because we can easily be misled by our own ideas of what is necessary to solve that task. As a way of helping us out here, um, Namath and some others have suggested that there are places we can look at, and one is the messy details. That is that they say that rather than trying to understand the detailed nature of work, rather than saying, okay, why are you taking an x-ray at this point, or why are you getting a CT scan at this point, they would say, we should really look at what, what does it take to get an x-ray? What does it take to get a CT? Because very often the messy details tell us more about the work world and its real problems than, than the sort of underlying nature of, of the technology. And an example would be one of the reasons that you get a CT is because the MR scanner isn't working. Or it takes too long to get an MR scan and the CT is faster. Or the CT is right next door but the MR is across the city. Or the fact is, I know the CT techs and I can call them up and they'll help me out by doing the scan now, whereas I don't know the MR techs. And if I try to do that, I won't be successful. Those are the messy details of ordinary work. And what Namath is telling us is that we, one of the ways to get into this understanding of what the cognitive demands are is to go and look at those messy details rather than trying to understand the sort of high-level technical stuff. Another thing that he has us look at uh, is cognitive artifacts. And he wants us to look at cognitive artifacts because it turns out that the artifacts that people make, the little notes, the, the uh, notations, the whiteboard marks, all the rest of these things, are things that people use to manage the messy details and get through the day. And since they're making these things up, they tend to include important details. So if you can get a hold of the sheet that the nurses are making up for themselves or the piece of tape that they put down that they're writing things on or things like that and analyze that, that you'll very often be able to find out what these messy details are and then be able to map these cognitive demands and understand what people are trying to accomplish as a way of accomplishing systems engineering. It's also clear that, that it's hard to do this, that it's difficult and demanding. Everybody, by the way, has talked to me at one point or another about how difficult this is to do, privately generally, because it's Sweden, um, about how difficult it is. And, and it is difficult. Getting this insight, getting this level of understanding is hard. But, but what, uh, what Potter and the others are talking about is bootstrapping. And by bootstrapping, what they mean is this approach of not trying to do everything all at once, but rather going into a place and trying to do some preliminary explorations, understand a little bit about what's going on, try and construct some of this, and then iteratively get better and better so that you use the initial results of your work to focus your attentions further, to get better understanding, which allows you to focus again more clearly on what the issues are rather than trying to do it all in one step, which is one of the reasons why we have so much difficulty in doing this with doctoral students, because your, your structure of doing work here requires you to write out a complete plan of everything that you're going to do before you've started any work, which is absolutely insane. And no one that I know of would ever countenance having such a system. It, it automatically guarantees that you will not learn anything. The whole point of the experience is to get into it and discover and learn. It's this discovery process. And so bootstrapping is deeply about discovery. And, and in fact, that's one of the main characteristics of cognitive systems engineering is this idea of discovering the, the underlying things. Mapping the cognitive demands is a kind of discovery. To help us do some of this, Woods and others have talked about process tracing. 
Woods has a very nice paper about process tracing, and, and, but we see that the idea itself is quite old. But the, the, the key thing is for us to get into where someone is trying to deal with some particular problem, and having done that, to be able to trace the process that they are using. And we, we like particularly um, worlds that are rich in data and have lots of actions. Because if we can keep track of the data as it's getting presented and we can keep track of the actions as they're being taken, we can lay out a process trace that will let us watch how people deal with the problem, which helps us go back to do this inference about what it was that they were encountering and why they approached it in that fashion. This is part of this, and what we find very often is that there's some sort of a kind of an oscillation that goes back and forth between these different points. That is, the process tracing is part of the bootstrapping. The bootstrapping uh, is, is aided by the cognitive artifacts. The cognitive artifacts, in fact, are, are some of the messy details. And these actually go back and become part of our process tracing because we can see people writing things down or making notes or using their charts and so on. These are all tied together. They're not really separate kinds of activities. They're, they're caught in this kind of web of, of the ways in which we can produce sorts of evidence. And we had, of course, uh, the two Emilys. who showed us some examples of doing this. And, and the two Emilys have, have really nice things. One, uh, 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 Emily Patterson has done this uh, for barcoded medication administration stuff, using barcodes to help uh, do stuff. But she's also done it uh, in looking at communications loops at mission control. Shuttle Mission Control in Houston. And, and one of the advantages that Patterson has is she's looked at a bunch of different worlds and she sees the same thing going on. And so developing some of these tools lets her help, gives her a way of, of approaching these worlds and she can actually do it in multiple different domains. And that's a real mark of an expert in this field, right? Is if you can do it not just in your home chosen domain, but someplace else, some, something, even something really quite different. And for her, Interestingly enough, it was this movement, it was the movement from space to medicine that was the big shift, right? Because she started out in this world over here and came to this one, the medical world. We don't have many examples of people doing the opposite, but we should have more because it's an important part of that step. And of course, Emily Roth, who's one of the founders of cognitive systems engineering, showed us how to do this with, with what, what she showed us was the uh, the train operator review. She showed us a nice example about how to understand what it was that these train control people were doing and why they were doing it in that way. So we've got two nice concrete examples, but we also have two sorts of, of suggestions that you can get a lot out of doing this sort of stuff. And then finally, we have, we have this whole different kind of way of thinking which, which really is quite different and, and which is, I think, uh, profound. And that's Gary Klein's naturalistic decision making and uh, recognize, recognition prime decision. And, and the idea here is that we really have to be able to look somehow at the way people really do things in the real world, what real, real decisions, how they actually make real decisions, rather than sort of taking the perspective that people do it wrong and we need to get them to do it better. I mean, the, the usual starting point for most medical people when they start to look at decision making is doctors make lots of mistakes and therefore we need to get them to do, the, do this better. But in fact, what we find when we study these things is we do find lots of variability in performance. What we don't find is easy ways to make the performance very good. In fact, it turns out to be very hard to make performance a lot better. And so we, it gives us, there, there, there should be, along with the cautions that we have as researchers now, 
we need to have some humility. Because it's easy to imagine that we have somehow discovered how people fail all the time and that we just have to get them to do the right thing. But what, what you would get from NDM and RPD is that's not a straightforward thing. It's easy to imagine that you could have the captain of the Stark shoot down the plane that's coming at him to sink his ship. And it's easy to imagine that you could get the captain of the Vincennes not to shoot down Iran air. But actually doing that, hmm, it's quite difficult. And there's a relationship that, that is very, very tight, interestingly enough, between all of this stuff, all of this researchy stuff, researchy stuff that we do over here and the experience of these accidents over here. And it's not a direct connection, but in fact, the connection here very often is Panger because it turns out that, that it's this kind of stuff that generates the Panger that's necessary to develop these kinds of ideas. And that goes back, as we said, to Three Mile Island. It all started with Three Mile Island. That's where everything begins. That's where the source of it all is. In fact, this entire story begins back here. Now, about 35 years ago at Three Mile Island. And what we see as this stuff, this re researchy stuff here, is the researchy results of Three Mile Island plus a lot of other accidents. I mean, it's, it, in a way, we are lucky to have the accidents keep happening because they, they, when people get bored and they think that they've invested enough, we have another accident and that jerks some money free and gets things started again. This is what we've been doing now for the past 35 years. And, and you know, that's a story we've, we've laid out. I mean, this is exactly what we've laid out over the last set of lectures and, and seminars. And you've all got the original papers for this, so now you could cite virtually any of these things. You have a citation for any of these ideas. If you wanted to write and say, I'm trying to do some bootstrapping for discovery, you can say, well, this is Potter. Here he describes this. Or if you say, we collected the cognitive artifacts, you can point to Namath and he will tell you that. Or if you say we're studying how people deal with the messy details, that's Namath again, you can do that. And if you say I'm trying to do some process tracing or trying to, trying to map something about the cognitive demands, you have those references and the basic ideas that you can use as a justification for the research that you're doing. That's the purpose of this course, which is not to get you to be expert at all of these things, but rather to give you placeholders for them in the world so that when you try to go and say what it is that you're doing, because you will do it before you have the reasons and explanation, you'll, you'll be able to point back to these things and say, this is where that comes from. This is that collection of stuff. It's in here that we get started. These are the two examples that we've used about how to do these things. And they're the most important ones in my view because they're nicely written up and because we can see so clearly that the writers of this are honest about what their experience has been and how they've done it. A lot of people have a lot of insight into how things work and so on. There are very few people who will tell you exactly how they've done it and what they found and why they think that particular way. And, and if either, if, if any of you have the opportunity at some time in the future to, to spend time with either of the two Emilies, it's certainly a worthwhile activity. You'll learn at least as much from spending time with the two Emilies as you will from anybody else in this pantheon of giants among the, uh, uh, among the, the cognitive science type people. I mean, you can, you can listen to Eric Holmagel and you can listen to David Woods. And they're very persuasive and very interesting people. But if you want to see people who are doing this right now, the two Emilies are really good people. The question sometimes arises, given all this stuff, is where do I start? This looks like such a huge collection of stuff that it's really hard to know where to start. And I, I would say that 
that the answer to that is probably someplace inside of this, inside of these these four things here. I think this is where we start, um, and 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 I think that where we start exactly in this is probably less important than, than that we do some of all of these, that we become somehow good at sort of switching between doing one of these and doing another one. A lot of this is driven by, um, a lot of this is driven by uh, stories, incidents, events, problems, and so forth that people will be telling you about in the real world. When you say to people, well, what makes work hard? They don't really know what to answer. But if you say, have you had any difficulty today? Was today an easy or a hard day? And if they say it's an easy day, you say, well, how, why was it so easy? And if they say it's a hard day, can you tell me in what way it was hard? You're going to begin to get inside of this enough that you can begin to use one of these sorts of things. I find personally that cognitive artifacts work very, very well early on because they're visible and they're external. You can see people make them. You can see them refer to them. And in general, they're not very controversial. Most of the time, people think of them as throwaways. In fact, many cognitive artifacts do get thrown away at the end of the day. They're little notes. They're like, they're like the notes that we make before going to the grocery store. And yet, when we find what's on that list and we look at what's going on with this, these become actually quite powerful sources of information about what it is that people are actually trying to accomplish and why they're trying to do it. And that connects up pretty clearly to the messy details of work and why it's done this way. One of the things that I find that's very interesting is to ask about the order of the messy details. That is, how do we, in what order do things have to be done? So people will say, I'm going to do this and this and this and this. And, and they generally have an order. And if you can find out why they have the order, you'll have a pretty good idea of some of the messy details. It turns out that a lot of these things about the order of in which things are done are actually quite practical. Um, and, and in the ICU, it's we, we draw the blood at 4.30 AM because then the results are available by the time the surgeon's round at 7. If we draw them later than that, some of the results won't be available and the surgeons will be upset. If we draw them much earlier than that, the results will be too old and the surgeons will be upset. So we find this particular point of time and we do this activity and we do it in this particular order because that's the way things work. And we give the patient a bath not at the time we're doing our, our end of shift routine but someplace in the middle because it takes some time and we have to be spending our time doing that sort of thing so we don't do it at the change of shift. The order in which people organize the messy details is a real strong clue about what it is that's problematic in their world and why they have to do things in the way that they do. And so if you can take the order that they give you and use that as a kind of entry point to, to getting them to generate explanations about things, you can learn a great deal. Much of this is listening to both observing the details and listening to people describe why it is that they're in this kind of situation. And in particular, a lot of this stuff has to do with the basic idea of what makes work. Hard. I mean, if you say, what do we do? We look for the things that make, work, make life difficult. We go where the pain is. And if you think about yourself as a clinician, that's exactly what you do, right? When you see a patient who's hurting, you don't immediately start talking to them about their occupational history. You start out by saying, tell me where it hurts. Tell me how much it hurts. Tell me when it hurts. Tell me when it gets better. Because that's what's on uh, that's what's important at that moment. That's also true about most of our cognitive studies. We're mostly interested in why is work difficult? Why do you have to be an expert to do this stuff? And somehow inside of this sequence of things that we can do and observations that we can make, 
we can find that answer. Probably the, the, the most powerful thing that we ever get to is when we can do a kind of, of a, an experiment that goes from the real world into the laboratory and then back to the real world. And, and so we'll do a bunch of observations in the real world. We'll ask people questions. We'll do all of this sort of stuff. And then we'll find and perhaps be able to do some little tiny experiment in a kind of controlled setting based upon some of that. We'll give them a problem to solve. We'll ask them about how they're going to confront maybe a list of patients for the day or something like that. And, and that will guide further guide our observations, our next set of observations in the world. And what makes our world different in some ways, or our approach is different in some ways from other people's, is that their usual approach to things is to invert the relationships. That is, they do a little bit of observation in the world, and then they spend a lot of time doing experiments. And it, gets to be, it takes up so much of their time that they never really figure out what's going on in the real world and have no idea what to look at next. Um, we can do experiments in the laboratory. We do have things that we can do. We can give people problems that they can solve and then do the tra problem tracing, the, the process tracing approach. That works. We can do that. And the process tracing approach that we use is very often giving them a kind of simulated problem. Um, if you're a chess, if you're studying chess, process tracing is pretty easy. If you're studying something else, it's a little more difficult. But if you look at the work that Namath did, if you look at his PhD thesis, Namath is doing process tracing as the basis of his PhD thesis by giving different people the same collection of resources and asking them to assign patients to the operating rooms for the, or, uh, I'm sorry, not patients, anesthesiologists to the operating rooms for the next day. He spent a lot of time looking and watching and doing all sorts of things. And in fact, the experimental portion of what he did was very small. A lot of it was based on this observation, but he was able to find this little thing that he could use as a probe and process tracing and get all the stuff out of it for his dissertation, which you have access to and which you can see. This sort of points you in a particular direction about where to look, what to pay attention to, how to do it. It's very hard to, to do this um, uh, effectively when you're also working in an area that's your own, when you're working in a domain that is the one that you already belong to. It's really hard to do this if you are, in fact, you know, a nurse and you're watching nurses. You can do it, but it's hard. And the reason it's hard is because you yourself um, have that problem of being already a domain expert. Um, the American author David Foster Wallace said this. He gave an example of, of uh, this in a joke about the two young fish who were sitting in their portion of the pond. And the old fish, the old fish walks by and swims by and says to them, hi guys, how's the water today? Then he leaves and the, other, the one young fish looks at the other one and he says, what's water? And, and that's exactly the problem that we have, which is that you know so much about nursing that you take for granted what nursing is and how it's done, and therefore you find yourself at a kind of disadvantage when it comes to trying to unpack that all and see it all in that fresh way. That's an obstacle, and that's, that's one of the problems that, that goes back and that Hutchins was warning us about, particularly with respect to this idea about the inference stuff up here. But <coughs> there are some things that are pretty effective. One is that practitioners, sorry, I should do this this way. Practitioners very often interact with other practitioners 
And these interactions are things that you can watch and record. And since they're practitioner to practitioner things, they tend to be about what matters for practitioners. And so if you can capture some of these interactions, if you can record some of what it is that people are doing as they're engaging with each other, Oh, the old symbol for a tape recorder. Nobody uses these things anymore, but if you, if you had a tape recorder, this is what it would look like. But if you can capture some of these interactions, then you have the opportunity to use these as a kind of process and unpack them a little bit to see what's going on. And so very often, one of the things to look at early on is, is when practitioners are talking to each other about something and how they describe it, what it is that they're talking about, and how, you understand, how they understand what the, what the issues and problems are that they're confronting. This stuff, this conversation, analysis of the conversation is really powerful. And so it's a very good way of getting information about what's going on and how to start this stuff. And I would encourage you to think very carefully about situations in which you have the, que have the opportunity to either ask practitioner questions, practitioners questions, or listen to them talk. Because in general, although you will very often want to ask them questions, listening to them talk is sometimes more revealing. In a way, it's better to be a little bit dumb and let them talk than to be very, very smart and demonstrate that you know a great deal about their area. It's a nice thing. It's a bit like that Detective Columbo. You remember Detective Columbo on the television show? I'm uh, uh, flips, uh, uh, just, just one other thing, ma'am. How, how, how is it that you could be uh, in the kitchen and also out on the porch at the same time. I just, I don't, how, how, that, how could that be? That's a very powerful way of, of, of having people do this stuff. But the more that you can stimulate this interchange, this discussion that, that's going on, the better your understanding will become about what it is that these people are actually trying to do and accomplish. And so one of the things that we do is look for situations in which people have to verbalize when they have to talk about their work, like either they're trying to talk on the phone to someone, they must then say something, they can't just gesture, or where they're talking to someone that they're working with in some way that allows them to get some sort of, exp uh, uh, make something explicit. But the point of this is that the more, you, the more you are able to find their own naturally occurring conversations, the more likely it is that you'll be able to find and hear the things that matter in that particular world. They generally are talking in a way that's meaningful. And so you can use that naturally occurring conversation as a way of getting out all sorts of information that you really would have a hard time getting if you just simply asked people for their, their description of what was going on. This tells you something about where it's useful to look. It's harder if you're doing what you're doing, Molly, in which you're trying to follow individuals around and see what they're doing. They don't have a, they're talking to the patient. They're not talking about their work. And so it's a little bit more difficult. But if you, go, if you watch them when they come back to the, the central location and they start to talk to each other, all of a sudden they will be explaining about this patient and what was wrong with them. And, blah, 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 blah. and you'll have that very nice an often very compact description, which if you record it, is very powerful in helping understand what went on before. It's also true about people who are planning to do work or people who are trying to coordinate work from across distances. And that's one of the reasons people like to continue to study control rooms is because there's lots of this kind of activity going on and it's all in an area where they can record it quickly and get a good idea of what's, under, what's on, ongoing there. It's also very helpful if you can get people to tell you stories about what has happened in the past. 
stories are very often encoded, very caref very highly encoded. That is, they, they are narratives that have a particular structure to them, but they're encoded representations of events, and they encode meaning. The stories themselves have a particular kind of meaning. Usually the meaning is very specific. If I'm talking to a young anesthesiologist, I say to them, ah, yes, you know, when I was just a resident, I was faced with a problem like this, and here's what happened. And the, we're trying to tell this story for a specific purpose. We don't tell stories just to tell stories. We tell stories because they have this kind of meaning which is encoded in them. And if you can hear the stories, particularly the stories that experienced people tell young people in the field, young practitioners, trainees, you have a good way of getting a hint as to some of the kinds of, of cognitive demands that are in the world, in complex problem-solving world, and being able to get a better idea about how you might expose some of the messy details that are there. The stories are also very powerful. These all suggest that there's a lot of value, by the way, to these audio recordings. That these might actually be quite valuable things, and I think it's true. I think audio recording we live in a world where audio recording is probably as powerful and in some ways more powerful than video recording. Audio recording is a much, much less obtrusive kind of activity than video recording. It doesn't raise the kind of concerns that people have if they feel like they're on camera. You can wear a microphone and have a, a small pocket recorder that makes a, actually a very good recording now. And very often you'll be able to capture lots of this stuff, including stories and other things like that, in ways that allow you to be quite precise about them. And this can help you a lot in terms of getting quality data. When you talk about trying to remember these things or what the importance was, it's really nice to have an audio recording because then you can go back and say, here is the actual construction of this thing. Word for word is how they told it. And You'll see some of the papers that we look at, people have done exactly that. They have these very fine-grained, specific things where you can see the text that people, uh, text that represents what people actually said. And so uh, if I were going to pick a tool, a mechanical tool, a piece of technology that's powerful in this world, it's the, it's the audio recorder rather than the video camera. Um, if you really, if you, if you, if you want to be able to get into this world and get out alive, Audio recording is a lot easier than video recording. Video recording has many, many benefits, but I will tell you that you will find that people are very sensitive in these worlds to getting too much going on with video recording. They're much, much more comfortable with audio recording. In fact, very often they'll forget that, it, that the recorder is on. If you're going to spend a few dollars, a few uh, crowns, a, a few euros on something, um, the thing I would spend it on is a, a good audio recorder rather than a necessarily a good video camera. You can borrow the video camera when you need it. But the audio recorder you want to have with you all the time. And I would just make it part of my kit. I'd carry it everywhere always with a couple of extra batteries and a couple of extra memory cards because I think the opportunity to sit down with somebody for 15 minutes and just have them talk about something can be very, very powerful. It doesn't free you from the need to take notes, but what it does is give you a way of taking, making those notes useful to you because now you can use the notes as an index into the recording and use the recording as the primary source material. And I would say if I were going to make any suggestion about the technology or the approaches that we're doing, I would, I would emphasize audio recording because it's got a much, much stronger track record for us than video does. There are places where video works well, but audio is almost always the, the, way to, the way to get things going. The other thing that is important is to, is to um, and this is, I think, really the, one of the hardest things, is to avoid um, buying the cover story. This is a real problem that we have, which is that almost all of the settings in which 
we are going to explore, there is some sort of cover story about what's going on, what's being done, why it's being done, what kind of technology we're using, what the function of the technology is, and so forth. And those things are worked out for organizational, social, political reasons, not because they actually do what people say they're doing. And for us, that's a great problem because being very often outsiders, the cover story sounds very plausible. Oh, we're doing this thing now where we're going to have um, the computer is going to work out for us the best possible solution to doing this, and we're just going to take the, run the computer on the data, and then we'll use that, and we'll put that in, and so on and so forth. And the computer's going to save time. It gives us a better solution, and so on and so forth. We actually did a study that where the cover story was exactly this. That, um, and, and it's the, one of the things, if you look up, um, um, if you look up with, uh, do a Google search on my name and military, um, patient evacuation. You'll get some references to the short paper that we wrote on this topic. But, but we were studying a system in which they were building a big, big com complex computer system to allow them to do essentially military evacuation of patients from all over the world on, on military flights. They knew all the flights. It was all going into the computer, and the computer would pick the best routing for people and get them home the fastest and so on. And it was all driven by the fact that, in fact, when you ever get, if you ever get involved in a war, the first thing you lose track of is where everybody is. And it's really, really hard with patients because there are people who almost all come out of the battlefield in various stages of being injured. And then they get to some place and they get rapidly passed backwards and they lose sight of where they are. They lose track of where they are. So they, built, they were going to build a very big system to help them keep track of where every patient was and every trip and every journey and everything. It's all going to be in the computer and it's all going to be done automatically. And now we aren't going to have to have people planning these flights and deciding you know, how many people can you get on a, on a DC-8, you know, which is laid out with stretchers and stuff. It was all going to be done automatically. That was the cover story. And in fact, they were writing lots of computer programs and doing all this sort of stuff, artificial intelligence and expert systems and automated algorithms and blah, 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 blah. What was interesting to us is that when we actually tried to figure out what the operators were doing in those things, it turned out that the operators were not simply sitting back and you know, drinking coffee and doing crossword puzzles while the computer did all this work. Uh, in fact, what happened was that in many cases, the, the computer would p spit out a solution which would, these are all the patients that you have to move, and some of these patients are patients which are critical. And then you end up with a solution, the, the computer comes up with a solution, and it gets... 98% of the patients moved, but leaves one of the criticals behind. That is, at the beginning, you have this. You do the computer thing, and then you're left with this. And it turned out that when we looked at this, we realized that none of the people who were working in this system ever considered it a pos ever considered that leaving this critical patient for movement behind, not moving them, in the period of time was an acceptable solution. That is, this is a good solution in a number sense. It moves 90% or 95% or whatever of the patients that are supposed to be moved. But it has this really big flaw, which is this guy has to move. And he isn't moved by the plan that the computer just proposed. And so what we found was these guys would go back and change the resources a little bit. They'd say, well, what, what would it be like if we, instead of having this one flight from here to here, we put another plane there. We had two flights. If that would happen, and then they feed some different resources and run it again to see if they could get this guy to move. And they would do this over and over and over again until they got this guy to move because the only thing that is an acceptable solution to them is one where they don't have any of the guy who, guys who have to move left behind. As long as everybody, you can have as many of these guys sticking around as you want, but you have to move all the guys that have to move. If, they are, if they're a critical thing, your job is to get them moved. And they would run this computer program over and over and over until they could make this happen. 
they were constantly trying to get that. That was for them the solution. And no proposed method that from the computer was adequate unless it solved the problem. And if you think about the problem that they were facing, this makes sense. Because if you go to your commanding officer and you say, here's the routes for tomorrow, sir. And he says, well, I see that one of the critical people hasn't been moved. You say, well, the computer said that, sir. This is not going to be an acceptable answer. So the, 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 the acceptable answer would be, yes, sir. That's the way it is, but if we can add another two flights from here to here and from here to here, then that guy will move. That's a solution. And, and your commanding officer will say, I will make that happen. Okay. What we found out was that instead of the, it converted the role of the operator from planning all these movements to running multiple computer simulations and trying to keep track of which set of different collections of resources made it possible so they knew what to offer and why. And instead of sort of sitting around, and, you know, drinking coffee and playing, doing the crossword puzzle, they were actively using the system. But what the, what the system needed to have was not, in fact, what they were planning on having. They had an image of a world in which the guy gives the problem to the computer, the computer solves the problem, the guy takes that solution and walks away with it. But in fact, these guys would stay in here and they would run this as a loop. They would do this, and they would look at it, and they would say, does it meet all the solutions? If it doesn't, we're going to go back, and we're going to change the resources. And we're going to keep doing that until we get these guys moved. And so they do this many, many times in a cycle. And so the problem there in the computer world became keeping track of what they were doing over time so that they knew which of these solutions they tried. The interesting thing about this is that the computer makers understood this, but they didn't understand what the cognitive demands of the, of the complex problem-solving world really were. The cognitive demand of the problem-solving world is figure out a way to get those four dots out of that box. Figure out a way to make sure that these guys who are critical get moved. And at some level, the two different kinds of approaches to the system are, the, are, are the, the real source of the cognitive problem. This becomes then what makes work hard. What makes work hard is that the computer doesn't understand that the whole purpose of this is to make sure these critical people move. I don't care about the rest of them. They can take a week. But these guys got to move today. And, and so what makes their work hard is changed by the addition of the technology so that now what makes their work hard is keeping track of all these different possible resource collections that they could give to the computer to solve the problem and figuring out which one of these does the job. Even if, even if it turns out, by the way, that they can't move them, they have to be able to go to the commanding officer and say, sir, we cannot move this person. And I have tried 20 different combinations of getting flights from here, there, and everywhere, and it still doesn't work. It doesn't matter. We can't use it. Instead of using this tool, Instead of using this tool as a planner, they were actually using it as a simulator. They were using the tool to simulate the activities of planning so that they could try different possibilities to see which ones produce the desirable result. It's a complete, the cover story is that this is a planner that it plans the moves. That's not what happens. And if you buy the cover story, you keep playing this game. OK, let's see. Can we make the planning better? Can we make it a little bit easier to do the planning, to get the planner bin, blah, blah, blah? That's not what they're using it for. They're using it to simulate a whole bunch of different kinds of patterns to figure out which one, if they can get to it, will solve the problem that they have. That's what makes their work hard. And if you don't understand the messy details and what they're trying to do in this whole thing, if you don't understand, if you cannot trace the process that they are trying to use to do this, you will miss all of that. You'll buy the cover story. You'll, you'll be, you'll be the, the kind of, uh, what we would say in the United States is the rube at the carnival. You know, the person who goes in to the fair and actually believes that there is, you know, a half ape man behind that screen there and we're going to go see it. If you buy the cover story right off the bat, you'll never see this stuff. You'll never get it. 
So one of the key things is to, to avoid buying the cover story. And people will offer you cover stories all the time. They will come in and they will say, here's what the job is, here's how it's done. Here's what I'm doing when I'm doing my remote co uh, communication protocol for handling uh, uh, clinical advising during uh, ESA, uh, ERCP. Here's what our telemedicine system does. Here's what our new computer system does. Here's what the nurses are doing. This is the way, it, it, this is the way that a, a nurse practitioner works in this field. Those are all cover stories. And your job is to be able to, not, not to say, that's a cover story, I'm not interested in it, how dare you assault me in this way, because you won't get very far with that. But instead to say, oh, what an interesting story. That's so interesting. If that cover story is the case, then I should be able to see this. And you go out and you don't find it. You say, oh, that's interesting. I noticed that that's not there. Maybe I should go look at something else. You have to avoid buying the cover story because everybody has got a political, economic, personal reason for wanting to have you buy their cover story. And so part of this is being able to detach yourself from all of those stories that you hear about how the system works and what's going on in order to be able to do something that is a little bit more subtle and a little bit more creative. Well, that's about all I have to say. What kinds of questions or issues do you think come up from this collection of stuff that we've talked about that we need to go into more? What's your reactions to some of this stuff? I know it's Sweden, but you could try. <laughs> Does this help you at all in terms of getting into or getting inside? There's no one technique that works. And that's one of the problems with writing this up as a sort of a methods thing for your, for your dissertation is that we don't use a method. We use a whole bunch of methods. And we keep applying them in different orders and different sequences and different places and different circumstances over and over and over until we get something that's worth following up on. I just did my work. It's like every day I go and do the work. I think it is quite difficult, and that's, as I, I said in one of the earlier lectures, that one of the reasons we look at control rooms and places like that is because they're pressure cookers in which we get the things and just about only the things that we're interested in. Home care is quite different. And, and so the question might be for you, when does it become a pressure cooker? So it, it's not all the time difficult. But there are times when it probably becomes so. If you're having trouble getting to see everybody, how does that affect the last two or three people that you see? If you are having difficulty accomplishing some task in some setting, what does that mean for the rest of your day? I mean, it's not the case that life is always, this is true about anesthesia as well. Anesthesia isn't always hard. In fact, anesthesia is pretty easy for most of the time. You know, I think a monkey could do anesthesia most of the time. It doesn't even require opposable thumbs. You know, you can just push on the syringe like this. It's a, it's, the problem is that you can't tell when those times are going to be and when it's going to be really difficult. So one of the ways to get inside of this is to try and figure out, is if you can't find them, is to let them tell you this themselves by asking them about the incidents that they encounter or the problems or the events that, they, that occur and having them recount them to you and looking for ways in which to capture that kind of stuff from their reports. And if you can find enough of these, if you can find enough of these, you can start writing little stories about an incident, which can then become an experimental kind of thing that you throw in here. So you can take your proposed situation and you can say to other people, what would you do if you were confronted with a situation where 
you had a patient who didn't look quite right, but wasn't really obviously sick enough and said that they didn't want to want you to do any more for them. They didn't want you to call anybody. How would you deal with them as an example? And and so what it may be is, is extracting enough of these incidents or events or problems that people can tell you about to be able to see if they're really common. Do people encounter these? How do they deal with them when they, can, when they have such a problem? There's another way to start opening this up. Sometimes it's a matter of, of having, list, getting a situation where you can hear one practitioner talk to another about problems that they've had during the day. Sometimes this might be, this could be in, in terms of, for instance, we would say a handoff, right? That's a possible way of, in which you could, could one of these thing, sorts of things. Or it could be just a conversation about what was difficult during the day. But very often, these things occur in a location where you might be able to capture some of that stuff. I'm, and, and this is one of the things that makes the research both interesting and difficult, which is that we're not saying to you, there's a mechanical way that you can go and do these things and all of a sudden you'll know. Instead, we have to figure out a way in and use that way in to sort of gradually drive a wedge into the problem until we're deep enough to be able to see it. And that's, that's difficult. That's hard. That takes time and effort. It, it requires some clarity about what you are doing. You have to be clear in your own head about what you're looking for much more so than, than the practitioners. They, will not un they won't understand any of this. You're the one who has to figure that all out. Another way to do this that, is, that can be very helpful is rather than with practitioners to do this yourself. This is a kind of, if you, if you, if you get stuck and you can't do it, then you do one of these discussions, but you do this discussion with you and another researcher. And what do you talk about? You talk about what makes work hard. But in this case, you talk about what makes my work hard. And now what you do is instead of trying to talk about all of this stuff, you say, you say, why is it that I am having difficulty? And the easiest way to do this is to talk to another researcher, another person who does this kind of work, and say, I'm having difficulty. I can't do this, or I can't, I'm, I'm struggling to do. What makes your work hard? This sort of thing applies to you as well as it does to them. You have to recognize that you're doing all this stuff at the same time, right? You're trying to learn how to be an expert that by, by handling for yourself a lot of messy details. You are making plenty of cognitive artifacts. You're doing all sorts of bootstrapping yourself to get yourself into this. And in fact, you're spending a lot of time trying to figure out through the day what your process has been. You are trying to, I mean, you're doing this again on top of what they are doing. And so one of the ways to expose this is to have that conversation. Take the, take the tape recorder, lay it out, take a whiteboard, you know, clean it off and say, here's what I'm trying to do and I'm having trouble doing this. And this is why I'm, this is what's been difficult about it. This is what I haven't been able to get. This is where I seem to get stuck. Those are productive conversations. They're productive because ultimately we recognize that there's no single answer that we are always bootstrapping ourselves into a better understanding of what's going on. And as I've told you before, when I get into this situation, I sit down and write a letter. I write the letter to David Woods. I sit at the computer and I say, David, I am having trouble with doing this, da 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 da. And all of my frustrations come out in that letter. I can't get these people to do this, and I've got this problem with administration, and I can't <laughs> figure out why the basluts are coming right and left, and I can't understand what they're about. And I just write it all down. I write the whole thing out. And because I know David, and he's a person that I trust, and, and who understands everything that I do before I do it, it's easy for me to write this. I don't spend a lot of time explaining what a basluts is. I just say, the basluts are driving me crazy. And 
And David, of course, never gets the letter. I just read through the letter and I've got the solution myself. These are just techniques. They're not, they're not solutions to your problem. They're methods for dealing with it. But, but it does help. And, and particularly, one of the great dangers in this work is becoming so isolated by ourselves that we imagine that we have done all this, but we haven't really penetrated it. That we've really, at some point, bought into the cover story. And we think we've done this, but we're actually not getting into this level of the thing. We haven't seen how the cover story is, in fact, misleading us. And that's very possible. And that's one of the reasons why talking to the other researchers is so good. And that's, by the way, one of the reasons why we are trying to develop a sort of critical mass of people to do that here is because doing this by yourself is extremely hard. And doing it with others turns out to be easier because you have people who are, who are doing the same sorts of things. So having a group of people who do this is a lot better than having trying to do it all on your own. You can imagine just trying to, you can imagine if you were just sitting in the library trying to read through all this stuff and figure out how to make it work. It's a big job. It's a lot better to be struggling with other people. So one of the key things is to be able to, to have that kind of contact and that conversation. That's right. <laughs> now you see why. <laughs> it's just a review. This is the last episode of our seminars for this time. And so what I wanted to do was go back and kind of put it all together into one piece for you uh -huh. and to show you where we have been and to give you a sense of how it all kind of connects together. Um, it won't last, this feeling, but you'll, you'll have it for a little while. But you can go back and look again and see this. Recognize that we are doing something. We, 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 we've gone very quickly through really deep stuff that people have spent their lives developing. So it's hard to get it all in one go. But but the key facts are that, that it is possible to get inside of these worlds. It's possible to do this, and and it's it's a little bit like making the atomic bomb. The first one is really hard. The second one is quite easy. Once you have, if you don't know that it can be done, the first one you make is very hard. Once you know that it is possible to do it, it's just a matter of puzzling it out. That's why the Russians could make the atomic bomb so quickly, is because once you know that it can be done, it's just a matter of figuring out how. Before it can be done, you don't even know if it's possible. Then you have no idea how to do it. The same thing is true here. By looking at these things, you know that it can be done. You know that it's possible to see inside these worlds. It's a matter of figuring out how. And you have lots of tools that you can use. Yeah, you can read it again. You can take it. You can copy it to your computer. You can take a look at it again. You can figure out all that stuff. Yeah. So it's going to be that way. It's, well, it's going to be there for the time being, certainly. But, but the key thing for you is not is it there, but what is it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 and, and in, in each case, what you have, if you, if you print it off the front, the first page, the, the document that goes along with it, explains why the stuff that's in there for that session is in there. And that stuff, if you took those pages and you put them together, you'd have a kind of map of what this is. That's what you need, is the map, so that you know where to find those things again when you're trying to figure out what it is that you're doing. We can always get the papers. They're out there. It is easy to get. Do not worry about the papers. It's not, it's not where they are. It's what they are that matter. And, and unless you have some kind of an appreciation for how this stuff all ends up together, mm -hmm. it's really hard to figure out what each paper means. Together, they make some sense. Individually, they're just papers. It's really, you know, you know they're kind of uninteresting. No, I shouldn't say that. But they're, they're, they don't, no paper by itself is enough. You have to have seen this whole kind of sequence of stuff and the consequences that flow out of it and the way these ideas get generated from that over the, spat, the last 30 years to have this kind of feeling about, OK, this is why we are, have the tools that we have today. 
They are not the tools we'll have tomorrow. You will develop tools that we will use tomorrow. This is just what they've got for you. And it's just because they're trying to deal with these problems. I mean, it's, it's all driven by these, by these pesky accidents which keep on happening all the way along. You know, we just can't get rid of them. They, they just keep right on coming. We're lucky. Okay, we're done.